And I'm in Gita. I'm the editor for IT Next, one of the group publications of uh, 9.9 Media. And um, I would like to introduce you today's speaker, um, Mr. Yashish Daya. He is the co-founder and CEO of Policy Bazaar. Um, just to give you a brief profile about uh, Yashish, Yashish Daya is the chief executive officer and co-founder at PolicyBazaar.com the largest online insurance aggregator in the country. Before starting the, his entrepreneurial journey with PolicyBazaar.com, he worked with First Europa, a global online insurance broker, as their CEO. At First Europa, he was responsible for leading the global expansion and managing the business of the company across nine geographic locations. He has also worked with ebookers.com, a leading an European online travel agency and led their business as, as the managing director. Uh, today, uh, he would be speaking about IT challenges in, a, in scaling a consumer internet business. Some of the key points that he would detail in today's discussion would be upgrading your team, issues with scaling, moving from IT development to strategic leadership via technology, and integrating with the rest of your business. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I would welcome Yashish to take on. Hi, I have a lot of But uh, I've been running this business policy bazaar. And uh, prior to this, I run a company called uh, eBookers. So I, I, I still been trying to figure out what cloud is doing this. And uh, if uh, some of you noticed, I was just reading up in Wikipedia what it's all about. So we don't, we don't do too much in cloud computing. Uh, you know, emails, etc. Over, uh, uh, you know, over SaaS, and we do some of the Microsoft products. But I'll just go through, you know, what Policy Bazaar is and all the challenges we faced, and uh, hopefully run through that pretty quickly, so that we can have uh, a more interesting conversation post that. Uh, <coughs> okay. Maybe that makes me a bit louder. Uh, so I'll, I'll do two things. First of all, I'll introduce Policy Bazaar and uh, what the business is about. And uh, second, uh, go through you know, what are the challenges we personally faced as we went through this journey over the last uh, five years uh, with Policy Bazaar. So you know, there are about uh, 50 odd insurance uh, companies in the market. And uh, the consumer tends to get a bit confused by what's right for him and what's not right for him. And uh, essentially, all we do is we you know, put all of these in a, in a rank order. Basis, basis, certain mechanism, and the customer finds value in that. So he comes to us, essentially to see these quotations. And that's, that's the primary business of an aggregator. Uh, something very important, and I think something which is uh, uh, misunderstood uh, by a lot of the industry. Uh, if you look at these two char uh, uh, you know, columns, this one is where the insurance retail industry is, and this is where aggregators of the business are. These are the kinds of products that are sold. So what you see here is something like a pure term. So these are products which are more utilitarian, which are more consumer friendly. Whereas the red one you see is the most consumer unfriendly product. So the entire industry, basically 80 plus percent of the products that the industry buys, and most of the insurance you guys must be buying, I can promise, are, are pretty crap products. And uh, essentially, aggregation is changing that big time. As you can see, those, those products account for only 3% of what an aggregator sells. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a fact that nobody's quite got, and I think some of the challenges we are facing is uh, you know getting the con getting the industry to understand this. Uh, if you looked at a product like online term, I don't know if some of you have looked at that. You know, pure pure life insurance, which is what a bulk of the West calls life insurance. Uh, there are only 120,000 policies sold in the country in a year, uh, versus about uh, about 30 million policies, no, 3 million policies sold. Uh, in, a, in a year in this country. So uh, clearly there is uh, there's some challenges that we have. And uh, aggregation has accounted over 60% of this. So we're basically trying to bring in consumer friendly products. That's what you can see from here. Yeah. Uh, I think another piece uh, that I just wanted to stress on why, why aggregation is so important and why uh, it becomes critical is of the top 10,000 most expensive keywords in the world, 2,400 belong to insurance as a category. So it's very, very expensive for an insurance company to attract traffic from Google. Uh, and uh, that is precisely why aggregation comes in. If you look at the two uh, you know, mechanisms, I'm just trying to explain my business to you so that you get a context of where I'm coming from. 
before we delve into IT per se. Uh, so if you look at these two charts, uh, the left hand one is Google and the right hand one is sort of any aggregator, doesn't have to be Policy Bazaar. Basically, the guy who pays the most is going to come up on top on Google, uh, whereas that doesn't happen in aggregation. What happens in aggregation is the product that's better, usually give or take 10% here or there, assume something is wrong, give or take, it comes up on top. And that implies that the guy who comes first and the guy who comes last is actually paying the same amount to be present there. So in a way, it kind of reduces the cost of marketing. Uh, obviously, that's visible. Uh, you know, 38, we work with 38 insurance companies now. And if you can see, it's taken about four or five years. This is quarter by quarter how many companies we work with. So there are 30, 38 companies that are available on the platform at this point. This is how the transactions have grown. Uh, what you're seeing in the last two years is a, is a kind of vertical rise of transactions. Uh, obviously, something, something seems to be working here. Uh, broadly, if you look at this chart, this is our business plan. Yeah. Our basic business plan is, over time, the red line is your cost of acquisition, and the green line is your number of transactions. So over time, your cost of acquisition comes down. It's the same as any e-commerce business. It's not very different. But the reason I mention this is, in the beginning, e-commerce businesses have a very high cost of acquisition. And uh, you know, I think a lot of you guys uh, would appreciate that. And some of us start very small. And that's when I come to the IT challenges that we faced when we started up. Uh, you know, some of those will come up. So um, you know, the first challenge we faced was when we started up, we had a four people IT team. You know, like, like any e-commerce startup, uh, you had a 10, 15 people team and you had four people working in IT. Most of these people were of the level of a senior developer because they could develop your application and you were quite comfortable with that. The challenge we faced one or two years in was you know, the team can only scale as much as the leader could. And more importantly, uh, you know, our, as our business grew, uh, the needs of that business grew. You know, we suddenly needed to have our own CRM application. We suddenly <coughs> needed to have our own tracking application. And uh, this team, while they understood it needed to be done, they wanted to do it all themselves, which is not a problem as long as you can hire people. And they were not willing to hire people better than themselves. Let's, let's put it that way, you know, simply put. So they were not able to scale up. And uh, you know, basically, some of those people you know, grew, and some of them did not grow. So some of them are still with us, and some of them continue to be you know, a significant members of the IT team, but some of them could not. Uh, I think the third part is very important for us as, as an e-commerce business. You know, the camaraderie was good, but too much camaraderie was a problem. Uh, because what that meant was we had a risk. You know, all that, that, that little group would work together, would leave together. And uh, if you did something which was not to their liking, they would leave. And as an e-commerce business, sometimes you kind of get held to ransom uh, in a way. And uh, you know, we had to bite the bullet in the right time. We, we you know, bit the bullet, and we obviously had to bring in somebody new. The important thing we also figured was, and I don't know, you, know, you guys might think this is really low end, but we needed to have specialists. You know, these guys were four senior developers. At the end of it, you need somebody to manage your database. You need somebody to manage your design. You need somebody to you know, manage your CRM system to focus on that. We needed a product management function, which in the initial days, we obviously could not afford a product manager. We couldn't afford somebody who would just sit between IT and uh, you know, in the early days, we were all working together. I think uh, you know, one of the issues with scaling was, was there a clear vision of where we were headed? And uh, did people uh, actually imbibe that? Uh, you know, because once that's sort of sorted, then, then people can take on. In our case, I think there was a clear vision, but it was very difficult to get it imbibed. Uh, we, we did uh, have that challenge. And you know, once we kind of bit that bullet, I think it came along to hiring the right people. You know, you'll, you'll basically find me just talking about people, because at the end of it, that's all that mattered. You know, if you had the right person doing it, uh, all you had to make sure was you got in the specialists. So you need a right leader, you needed the specialists, uh, as long as they knew what they were doing. And then you need to have diversity. So we, we have a rule, we don't hire two people from the same organization. We just, you know, we, we made that rule maybe after learning. Uh, because uh, it's good to have people who work together, but it was a problem for us as well. Uh, I think the fourth thing we learned was, uh, was patience. It takes time. Uh, you know, these applications don't, uh, even a simple application like Policy Bazaar uh, is, is quite an evolving one. And it's taken us about uh, four or five years to build that out. Uh, if you look at the partnerships, the 38 partnerships, they did not happen in a day. Uh, you know, it took a lot of time talking to those companies, getting them on board, getting all the integrations done. 
um, a typical integration with a single insurance company took us between six to nine months. So obviously, you know, uh, you need people to do all of this, right? So you, you, needed, you needed those uh, uh, people and we had to, you know, the next point was we had to over invest in aligning to business because uh, business was headed in a certain direction and IT was becoming monolithic for us. It was very important that, you know, if we had a car business, car insurance business, we had some people aligned to the car insurance business. And I remember, you know, we reached a phase. This is, this is now we moved on from the first phase, which was, you know, grow your team, get some specialists. At the next phase, we moved on to the car insurance guy says, but you know what, the IT cannot deliver. They understand. So we've got this layer of leaders who understand what needs to be done, but they don't have anybody to actually do it. Because, and, and you know, this was something we faced all the time. And then what started was business started asking IT a very simple question. Who is working on my projects? I want to understand who is working. Very simple stuff, right? But this, for someone like us, I, I just put this in perspective, you know, because you guys have asked me to talk about e-commerce. For someone like us, who's one of the top, I'd say definitely top 10 e-commerce companies in the country. For someone like us, we didn't know for a business unit who was the person who was actually working on it. And it's not just us. Even the CTO didn't know. Because uh, he would have uh, one person working on three, four projects. So many times you would go for the car insurance business, he'll say, you know, Narendra is working on it. You go for health insurance, Narendra is working on it. And it was like, what all is Narendra doing? So you know that project management piece had not really fit in. And that becomes very important for us. Uh, so aligning to business, the first thing we did about two, three years ago was we strengthened something known as our product management business. Product management was the layer in between, again, this must be really straightforward to you guys, but to us it wasn't. So product management was a piece between business and IT that basically took uh, the base requirements of the business, converted them to something like almost a wireframe, and gave it to IT to deliver. Right? So they, they, are, they were the business analysts, they agreed all, they understood all the stuff, and then they gave it to IT. But those guys needed to be by, by BU. Uh, at the BU level, they started managing most of the stuff. So we did not have one CTO, you know, presentation to the entire organization on all the projects they were running. We just stopped that. We just said, just do that at the BU level. Just update once a month. But at the BU level, we wanted to have enough control. And I think um, the third thing we did was we scaled up the scope of IT. So clearly, IT wasn't just delivering the uh, car insurance business or the health insurance business. They were also part of marketing. They were also part of tracking. Not just part of it, they were the, they were the core enablers. And I think uh, we had to retain the agility in the process. Uh, at, at some level, while we were willing to wait for six, nine months, we weren't willing to wait for two years. And uh, you know, fundamentally, what we had conceptualized would change within two years. So it was, it was no point having a you know, very, very long delivery schedule there. Uh, and, and basically, we broke it down into two pieces. One was business aligned, and one was core. So today. We end up having almost 100, 100, you know, 100 odd people IT team, but they are very well aligned along various businesses. Those businesses know what those people are doing. And there is a core IT function, which is more to do with the database <coughs> management, infrastructure management, et cetera, which they continue to manage. Uh, I think increasingly we are starting to use IT as a strategy. Uh, obviously, we are innovating in our industry, but uh, what that implies is insurance companies also need that innovation. So we are starting to now deploy our platforms with insurance companies. Uh, more on what I believe is the cloud. So essentially, these insurance companies pay us on a pay-per-use pay basis. They don't pay anything upfront for the development. They essentially pay us whatever, 1% or 0.5% whenever they use the platforms. Uh, so basically, that's the standardization and productization of, uh, of whatever we develop for ourselves is now, is now becoming relevant in the industry. Uh, and uh, obviously, it's become a little error-free compared to earlier when we had a lot of people dependency. Uh, I think it's now core for us as, so there are companies where we give this platform away for free also. So we don't charge them anything into the future. Uh, the primary reason is for us, uh, as a leader in the marketplace, it's important that we retain that leadership. And that leadership comes from supplier relationships. Uh, and hence, having our platforms at the supplier end becomes very vital to us. That also allows us better tracking of our business. Uh, and it also allows us to have uh, better conversion rates because we believe our platforms from an e-commerce perspective are superior to enhance conversion. So essentially, there are insurance companies where we'll just deploy it for free. And for an insurance company, this is quite a shock because they are used to spending you know, quite a lot of money building these platforms, maintaining these platforms, uh, 
and if they just get it entirely for free, you know, there is there is uh, there is there is a value prop there. Uh, and of course, IT increasingly has a potential to lead, uh, you know, our our strategy. So our CTO does get involved in the strategy side quite a bit now. Uh, but that's that's basically what I had to say. Sorry, it's a short presentation, and I don't know how many of you guys, uh, you know, uh, have a have a keen interest in the uh, e-commerce side. But uh, uh, that's what I had to say. If there are any questions, I'll be you know glad to take those. Yes, please. Yes. Sure, I'll answer that. So in my previous uh, uh, business, uh, I had outsourced IT. Uh, we, we spent about a million and a half pounds. Uh, we got nothing. <coughs> and and uh, it was to a pretty uh, significant organization uh, where I had uh, people. So I don't believe any uh, e-commerce business. See, when we do e-commerce, our core is online marketing and technology. Uh, it is it is the core of what you do. So you cannot really outsource that. Uh, what you get from our, uh, and and one of the reasons I'll also come to uh, you know the fact that did we have IT competency or did we just have lack of resources? So the two different uh, pieces. We understood what we wanted to do uh, very well. In fact, when we started, we knew two years out what we wanted. It is um, we just had a certain amount of money, and uh, we had to make sure that our costs never exceeded our uh, you know. So if somebody there was this, this. So if you look at an Amazon, you look at an eBay, you look at the top 100 e-commerce companies, they would essentially become specialists at IT. I think uh, they would not outsource their IT. Uh, that I'm fairly confident of. So we, we take great pride in kind of, today if you look at our platform, we've got everything end to end, starting from an online tracking system to uh, uh, the website, which you see, which is just a part of it, to a CRM system, to a database management. It's all our own proprietary system. And uh, now there's great value in having built that. Because uh, insurance companies, as I said, are increasingly taking on to this system because they just find it. And plus, there's a lot of learning that's gone into it. You know, uh, Remember, I've been in e-commerce for about 11 years. So we, we, we almost know which dot where will work. Uh, another thing I would, I would, I would you know, with, with humility state, there are not more than 100 businesses in this world that have ever hit a billion dollars in e-commerce. So uh, I'm talking about gross revenues. I'm not even talking about net, et cetera. It's a very specialized skill. And I, uh, I do believe it doesn't exist. So I do not believe it exists in the sort of you know, uh, IT world. So I do not believe, I don't want to take names of companies. I do not believe they can deliver it. They may, they may promise, and it may seem very easy. But eventually delivering it is tough. We have 10 minutes. You can, we can yeah. take questions. Apart from IT, one of the other real challenges I think uh, so. Uh, so IT, I would say, wasn't the biggest challenge. Uh, it became a challenge for a short while. Uh, you know, when when we had uh, mm. the CVs of our entire IT team being floated to a competitor and all that stuff. So uh, that that does happen once in a while. But besides that, it wasn't really the big challenge. We we knew. So you got to see. You know, before this, we did first Europa, Before that, we did eBookers. So we've been doing e-commerce for about 11 years. So we knew what to do. I think uh, the biggest challenge in an e-commerce business is actually fundraising. Uh, you know, once you have the funds, and I think the second biggest challenge, and I actually I'll reverse that. I think the biggest challenge in an e-commerce is knowing what you're doing, and knowing that you're going to do that for 10 years. I think the second biggest challenge is fundraising. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you my my take on that. Uh, there are about uh, there are about 50 odd VCs out there, each of who has invested at least at least 30, 40 million dollars in the market. There are only two companies who've ever made it to profitability in the e-commerce world in India. So obviously, there's a dearth of uh, you know entrepreneurs who understand the gravity of actually building an e-commerce business, uh, and that's basically make my trip and uh, uh, and uh, InfoEdge, the, which is which is Nokri.com. There's there's nobody else who's kind of reached even profitability. Even make my trip is now sort of you know profitable, not profitable. It's sort of out there. So it's it's a tough business. It's a very tough business. And I think uh, getting people who can build it is the biggest piece. And the second biggest piece is funding. And I think uh, tech certainly comes a third. I think there are other, other pieces can be figured. Yeah. yeah my, uh, my question is that uh, how do you assess the competition? In e-commerce, that's the biggest challenge. How do you can very quickly and rapidly successful business model? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So see, uh, I think I think in e-commerce, uh, uh, free traffic is see most difficult thing is traffic. The biggest expense is on marketing, and I think a first mover advantage there helps a lot. Uh, I am I am yet to see any first mover ever displaced. Uh, not just uh, you know. So so I think I think a first mover advantage is very important there. If you can get the traffic up front, I think the learnings you get in that process uh, help you you know get your operations scaled up. Uh, which makes it further difficult. In an industry like ours, uh, where the suppliers are usually slow to move, uh, that's a third advantage that you know, if you spent four or five years integrating suppliers, if somebody starts today, they would take another two, three years just integrating suppliers. And you know, usually in doing all of that, usually you die out before you kind of, you know, and the e-commerce is a heavy investment uh, business. Uh, so my, my take is, you know, once you've got something like a Flipkart going, uh, the investment they require from here onwards is, is way lower than what somebody who wants to, you know, or, or let me say, I don't think Make My Trip has the best uh, interface. Uh, but I don't think Clear Trip will ever overtake Make My Trip. And, you know, I think, I think Clear Trip has a good interface. They've got, you know, quite a few things of what it takes, but they're still at about one third to half the volumes of a Make My Trip. I think the first mover advantage becomes significant. Yes, please. That's the first year. First year. Yeah. Today, today we are at about fifteen hundred. What are the cost that Basically, it's your marketing cost. It's basically your marketing cost and your, you know, if you have any fulfillment cost. Not the technology cost. Uh, no. So technology cost we keep as a fixed cost for now. Uh, we 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 see it as as a fixed cost. When you started this business, uh, were you worried about uh, the We are, and I do believe uh, you know bandwidth would change stuff. Uh, so I think uh, once your broadband penetration becomes significant, it would. But see, I'll tell you why we were worried and we were not worried. The reason we were not worried was uh, we realized a bulk of our, per, of our searching will happen from offices. And offices have decent bandwidth. So while uh, also it's the, from an insurance product perspective, it's mostly the male who's searching. You know, he's, the, he's the one who goes and buys that. And most of these people are in offices which have decent bandwidth. So, so we see a lot of queries in, in that time. Uh, home queries are less. And I think uh, you are right. I, I uh, personally don't even feel our own site is very well designed for uh, home queries yet. So you know, take, take that point fully. But, but you know, one of the things that I learned, again, about e-commerce was that uh, it, you, you don't do it for tech. You do it for the commerce. So you know, when it becomes important, we would obviously lighten it. But right now, we don't kind of see that. Sorry, please. You said you don't have a cloud setup. So how do you plan to scale your systems? You know, so we would like to have a cloud setup. <coughs> See, we are, we are learning. And we were just talking that it would be good if you know, all our infrastructure costs, etc., could move to the cloud. Uh, so we are, we are learning about it. Uh, at this point, we are based out of NetMagic. Uh, sorry, now, now Tata VSNL. And all our infrastructure resides there. Yeah, how do you plan to scale with the increased traffic, not traffic, keeping increased traffic? Yeah. So uh, currently, basically, it's with uh, buying more and more hardware and with making our applications more efficient, the lighter. I think more on the latter side than on the first side. The first side, I just said, as a defeatist comment. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's mostly going to be by, by kind of lightening the application. Uh, we'd be delighted to move on to the cloud at some point. But uh, I think uh, now we have to see, have, are we already over-invested in what we have uh, versus, versus the alternative? We don't know. We don't know the answer. There will be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there would be. There, there would certainly be. And I think most businesses that already exist are thinking about, you know, how do they do it? Do they do it move application by application? Or how do they manage this entire transformation? Certainly makes sense. There's, there's no doubt about that. Suppose uh, you have to start a new e-commerce venture. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything would you like to do differently than what you did before in India? So I think I would uh, start with a core IT co-founder. So just to, just to give background, I don't think it became very clear. I was the CTO of eBookers. But I was a CTO from a business perspective. Uh, I, I would like to have a core <coughs> IT co-founder with us, rather than somebody who's, who's, who's a business person but also understands technology. I would like to have somebody who understands 
who, who's a technology person but also understands business. So I would like to have a co-founder of that sort. I think that's, that's a core uh, change I would make. Uh, because today I feel our CTO may not have enough equity in the business. And I would like to have that change. I'd be delighted if he had you know, as much as I did. Uh, because that would change things quite a bit. I think besides that, I think we've built the business with a lot of um, hindsight. Uh, because we were operating in the European markets on the same business. Uh, so as they say, you know, hindsight is the best vision. So you can, you can see everything very clearly. So you know, without being blatant about it, we are almost sitting in 2020. Looking back you know, seven years into the insurance market, and seeing how it's going to reach there. So, we, so we were, we've been very, very confident from day one about what we are doing, the fact that it is right. Uh, there's not been any ambiguity there. So I think, I think we are, we're OK from that side. But we would like to, you know, as I said, the tech part. Yeah. Sir, uh, I have taken a number of uh, recent policies to the policy where I work. But I didn't get any single amount of money in form of bonus and whatever it is. Uh, but uh, recently, I have availed the personal loan from the bank which I don't know. And uh, they refunded the whole processing fee as well as uh, they also provided uh, some additional debt. So yeah. I want to ask one person that why are you not providing such type of uh, benefit for your customer to make yeah. a good relation with, your, uh, with yeah. the existing customer? See, the problem with insurance is it's illegal here. So if we were operating in loans, we could do that. Or if we were operating in travel, we could do that. In insurance, any kind of bonus, any kind of incentivization towards purchase is illegal. Uh, it's just not, it's not, just not authorized. So if I were to do that, you could take me to court. So if I, if I gave you like even a microwave or you know, anything, you'd take me to court. You could. And uh, you know, the idea is, so insurance is a very regulated uh, sector. That's the, that's the problem. Yes, please. So remember I said something about uh, there just being two companies that become profitable, yeah. Yeah, so we've been uncanny in that, yeah. So exactly the revenue we projected and exactly the profitability we projected, we're hitting exactly that. So we're not off by more than 5% on both. And uh, I can almost say year by year, every year, we've been doing that. Uh, so business model changes, everything changes, but our numbers stay exactly the same. So that's, you know, I don't know whether it's, uh, you know, we plan too low or we plan too high, but, uh, but that's, that's true. But I think that comes with a lot of experience. Remember, I have done two e-commerce businesses before this. So I think if I did better to do the third one, I'd be able to predict quite well what's going to happen. Or the fourth one, you'd be able to predict even better. But the first time, it's almost impossible to get it. You know, there's, uh, there's no way you could get it the first time. Or, or you'd have to be extremely lucky to get it. So I think we've been, we've got. Uh, we, we've broken even now. So uh, we, we have broken even, but it's a you know, limited break even. You kind of break even for two months, and you make a loss for us for a month, then you break even again. So it's not something that I would kind of, uh, you know, write home that we're out of the woods yet. But, uh, or, or there are parts of our business which we do. Uh, see, we've been taking bets step by step. There are parts of our business we would rather not do, but we do them for revenue. Uh, so we have an inquiries business, which we would rather not do. But we do it because, you know, currently it makes sense from a revenue perspective. Uh, we want to get rid of it. So we'll get rid of it whenever our profitability becomes, becomes comfortable. But we're at that point. You know, step by step, we're kind of making it a better business. Thanks very much. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Just a moment. I would request Sujay, our HR head, Sujay Basu, to hand over the moment. Thank you, everyone.